All right, so far in assignment six in our logo design, we sketched out an idea. We brought it into vector.com, or if you have uh, computer-based software, Adobe Illustrator is the industry standard for this. And we, using the pen tool, using the shape tools, uh, plotting our own anchor points and curves, we tried to create a solid black shape vector. And we saved it as an SVG file. If I was doing it in Illust Adobe Illustrator, I would save it as an EPS file, but they're both portable vector formats. And part of that process is that you make the custom shapes, cutting them out of black using anchor points, but then you also have to sometimes subtract shapes like that ellipse there, and then sometimes subtract pretty complex shapes like the inside of the glasses here. And you also want to fill all of your shapes so you see how the little nose is outlined there. That's just a border or a stroke and not a fill path. And so I turned everything into fill paths before I saved it. Because the next step, this is your finished logo, the black cutouts. You can see my SVG here. If I open it up in just the default preview program on a Mac, oh, weird. Oh, I think because it's an SVG, not an EPS, it's going to open up an Illustrator. But if you are to open it up, then you'll see that it, it has no pixels. You know, it is perfectly smooth from every, every conceivable zoom, right? And it means that basically, because it's based on these anchor points, you can see them there, that can be moved and adjusted. Woo. That, no matter how small, right, that this file will then rasterize to whatever screen or whatever resolution we would want it to fit on. So it's what's called a scalable vector. It scales to whatever the media is. So that's an incredibly useful piece of digital art. In one file, it can be any size and perfectly clean. So then we brought that into Photopea and we added some effects. The first effect we added was just a white offset. So it shows up on different backgrounds. But then you can also use layer styles to create color effects drop shadows, strokes, gradients, texture. And so this is where I ended with the last video. But there's a lot more you can do. And so this was actually the next step I took. And you can see that I started filling in some of the empty white space of my black logo for the color version. And I started to to differentiate so that this cloud got filled in with kind of green, whereas this got filled in with a different gradient, instead of it all being treated the exact same way. So I'll show you kind of how I did that. And then I even composited in this extra element because I liked kind of the roundness of it and the, the color and the energy that gave. So you can do a, take a lot of liberties with your color version I even have a very subtle um, duplication of my black logo so that it looks like it was misprinted and just looks a little more hand done. So you can take a lot of liberties with your black shapes, with your color versions. And as long as your black shapes are strong, that logo should still read clearly. Okay. So. All of this took longer than I have in the class time. There are a lot of optional things because I was getting kind of invested in it. So I'm just gonna strip it back and try to show you what that looked like. And that might inspire some of your color solutions. And this was all in Photopea, 
just using layer styles and different uh, techniques of selecting and layering that we've learned so far in our compositing projects. So there's a reason compositing came before everything else. Almost there. Okay, so the first thing I did, and I like to do when I'm designing original digital art that's either a logo or a spot illustration, which will be our next assignment, is I like to put it onto three different backgrounds. White, middle gray, and black. So I can always see how it looks. So the first thing is I had my black vector that I brought in as a smart object. Problem is, it doesn't show up on the black background. So what did I have to do? I had to add offsets. I keep turning it on and then turning it off. Whether that's an outer glow or a stroke or a drop shadow. But in this case, the drop shadow is changed to normal mode so that it shows up and it's white. It's kind of a reverse drop shadow. And I actually kind of like this because on black, it looks like neon lights kind of shining behind the black shapes. But on gray, it looks like this. And on white, not great because that drop shadow and that inner glow makes you lose some of the content. So what you're looking for is a use of offset on your black logo shape that works on all three backgrounds. Oh, it's because the stroke wasn't an outside stroke that it starts to impede and hurt it. So if I, if I just do the outer glow and the drop shadow, then that works pretty well on the gray, works really well on the black. So that's the offset I used. So next, I want to play with color versions. So I played with the stroke, I played with the color overlay, and I played with the gradient overlay. And I used uh, the dissolve blending mode, you can see dissolve there, to give it that texture. So it's only at 86% opacity. So I actually have two uh, vectors layered on top of each other here. One underneath, one on top. Then what did I do? Well, then I wanted to fill in the space behind the black logo. So I used some compositing. And what I did is I actually took my sketch and I brought it in. And I brought in a sketch that had uh, what's called color blocking. It was this one. And I could do this just by kind of outlining with the lasso tool as well. But what this did, did is it gave me kind of a nice textured shape that I could then use hue saturation to color. And so I wanted to make it more yellow. And then I used a process uh, called half toning, which was a filter under stylize. And you can half tone, and we'll be learning this. Um, and just play with it a little bit. And so what that did is it made it look like old printing. We'll be learning this when we do digital coloring on our spot illustrations. And this, none of this is required for your logo. It's just the kind of thing I like. I like digital things to look handmade sometimes. And so what that did is it gave me kind of a background to composite to fill in for the skin. And then I did the same thing with the glasses, but I made those more, more yellow. I'm going to cut those out of the yellow shape. So when I layer them on top of each other, I get yellow glasses and red offsets. So then, if those get moved behind,
my different logos I changed the gradients a little bit. I made it a little bit darker through the middle. Now we not only have the fill of the gradient with dissolve, but I also have the, the fill behind the vector. And I was liking that. Then I just started doing some kind of custom things. I wanted to change the color of this. So, this is a great method. The beauty of a vector is that you can always select from it and get perfect selections. So to change just this part of the vector, I go to one of my vector layers, my smart object layers. I just use my lasso. Select that chunk and then duplicate it. Just like when we were compositing and we'd steal parts from a landscape or from a, a photo of a creature. And then I hit Command-J and it copies it onto its own layer. It rasterizes it as well. But as long as you have that vector, you can pull perfect scaled versions and then do whatever you want with them. So I did that and then just filled it with a yellow cover color overlay and gave it a little bit of an outer glow of yellow. Come on. Just takes a while for those eyeballs to turn on and off. Now this of course makes uh, the file bigger and bigger. And then I kept playing with it and, and added a slight gradient effect as well. And then I layered over that with just uh, another pass of my sketch. But this time I said lighten the sketch. And so that took the, and I heightened the contrast. So it took the natural variation in the pencil and made it look like this. So a little bit stronger texture. So the vector is about the shapes, but the raster is all about the color and the texture. And then I wanted to, to deaden all that a little bit, so I put another vector layer on top. But this time I set it to an effect of bevel and emboss, and then just took its, its overall opacity down a bit. What the bevel and emboss does is it gives you kind of a highlight on one side and a shadow on the other side, and it makes it just a little bit more dimensional. And I help kind of darken and even out all of the bright colors I had before. And then I layered that a few more times until it looks like it's printed by a stamp. And then I decided that I liked that, but I wanted to add another effect. And so I just composited in some flames behind it from a letterpress logo that I was inspired by. And then I customized them. So I, I built them out of different parts and I let them overlap it in certain ways. and turn them off in other ways until I got to my, my finished result. Which was then all saved and united at the top. So it shows all the components that a color logo can be made from, but notice that it all works with that vector shape being the consistent source for all of your pixels. So you can use a vector as a perfect stencil.